Hi everyone, thanks for joining us to learn more about the Nebraska Reading Improvement Act, um, also known as Nebraska Reads. Today we're really going to focus on looking ahead to summer and um, some of the necessary components. I'm Steph Lundgren from ESU 8 and um, when we did this as a live Zoom, we didn't hit record right away. So um, I'm going to talk you for the through the first few slides and then Abby Burke and many participants from around the region will join in. Uh, you'll see the uh, shortener at the bottom of the screen and you can access this presentation there. Um, there are a few links throughout the presentation that you might want to um, be able to access. So today's agenda is to review the key requirements of the Nebraska Reading Improvement Act share ideas for summer requirements, answer questions and problem solve. And of course, because you're viewing this as a recording, if you have any questions at all or, or need help problem solving, please reach out to Abby or um, to me and we will help you out. Um, our emails are at the end of this presentation. So um, this is a video that NDE produced to help explain the Reading Act. It's um, something that would be great to show to teachers who are new to understanding um, all about um, Nebraska Reads. It would be great to show to your school board. Um, also, I think it would be wonderful to have on a loop um, during parent-teacher conferences, maybe out in the hall, or maybe this is something you just email out to parents so that they understand it better. So we'll go ahead and watch this and um, give you a look at it. Reading opens children's eyes to a world of exciting possibilities. As far as the eye can see, imagination can follow. Learning to read by the end of third grade gives children foundational skills for the rest of their education journey. Research shows when students enter fourth grade as strong readers, they are more likely to graduate high school and succeed in college and careers. Nebraska Reads is an initiative established to support the Nebraska Reading Improvement Act and early literacy across the state. It includes a focus on high quality literacy instruction in every classroom and empowers schools to identify students who need extra reading help in kindergarten through third grade. Schools utilize assessments to identify students who may struggle with early reading skills and provide supports based on those results. Caregivers of students who are not reading on grade level are notified and receive strategies and tools to support reading at home. Teachers and parents work together to create individual reading improvement plans. These determine the specialized supports, such as targeted reading instruction during the school day or summer reading programs to ensure all students are reading on grade level by the end of third grade. Reading is a 24-7 activity. Here are three tips for families to make reading a fun part of your daily routine. Read together for at least 20 minutes every day. Ask a teacher or librarian to help choose books that match your child's interests and reading level. Have your child practice reading aloud and sounding out new words by leading their own story time. When schools, teachers, and families work together, we can ensure all children have the reading skills they need to be successful for the rest of their education journey. Visit the Nebraska Reads website for more reading tips and resources. All right, so that gives us a great um, shortened view of what the Nebraska Reading Improvement Act is. And again, would be great to share. Um, we do have a link at the end of this presentation to um, uh, the uh, NDE's um, uh, webpage on Nebraska Reads, and I think it's right here next. So that's how you can access it. Of course, if you're on this presentation, just click that link and it'll take you there. And the goal of this legislation really is that all students um, are reading at or above grade level by the end of third grade. Um, and we address this goal through, you know, our school improvement plans or, or our, uh, continuous improvement plans of CIP, but also through our MTSS. So I think most schools are doing a very good job of problem solving this out. 
So some key components that we're going to talk through next um, are school board policies, teacher effectiveness, early identification and assessment of skills, individual reading improvement plans, parent engagement, and summer reading opportunities. But we're also going to um, fill you in on some um, considerations that you'll have due to COVID-19 and um, the change in um, education that we're experiencing this spring. So um, your school board may have adopted a policy um, to um, address the needs of this legislation. So school boards may develop policies and facili um, to facilitate reading instruction and intervention services to address student reading needs. And they might be in even include dyslexia, but it doesn't have to be just limited to dyslexia. So you might have a handbook or something. The link at the bottom of the screen actually takes you out to a sample policy from one school district. Um, so that might have been something that was addressed last year by your school or something that they're going to look forward to doing in the next year or so. Teacher effectiveness is also an important component. Um, legislation says that all K-3 reading educators should be effective reading teachers as evidenced by um, evaluations of classroom observation and student improvement on reading assessments or that they have specialized training in reading improvement. So when you think about um, many of your K-3 uh, teachers have had a reading methods course in their college courses, um, that would be specialized training in reading. Um, and so we really have to think about um, the use of our teachers and who it, who's um, teaching reading and um, uh, teaching the interventions to students. Do they have reading training. Another component is early identification and assessment of skills. So um, NDE has come up with a list of approved assessments and um, you know your school needs to think about which assessment you're using. Um, in ESU8 most schools are using a cadence reading K6. Uh, we offer training on that. Um, uh, we have ESU1 schools joining us today. A lot of them use AIMSWeb. That's approved also. And then um, we have some dabbling with um, MAP reading fluency, and that is also an approved assessment. I'll show you a link to um, all those assessments in just a moment. So just we need to make sure that that um, screener is, um, is approved. And then you also need to think as a staff about when you're gonna give those um, assessments. So they must be given three times a year to K-3 students, and most schools do that, even K-6 or K-5. Um, and so you're gonna pick dates for beginning, middle, and end of the year. And the first screening must take place within the first uh, 30 student days of school. Okay, so we, um, you know, you get that in in the first 30 days that school that students are in attendance. All right, and now we're going to let Abby take it away and um, give us some more information and have you guys hook up with our live Zoom. I've been questions about the in the fall, and um, we're not we're. We're not sure. Um, at this point, yes, um, will all schools will be required to administer that assessment, that uh, fall assessment within the first 30 days. However, um, we do know there is rumblings and talk of schools perhaps not opening or there being rolling closures. Um, so we'll have to be responsive to that at that time, just as we are with um, this, this uh, spring waiver. Okay, so this is kind of um, just like a little cheat sheet of what needs to be done, um, you know, as you start a school year. So you think about that assessment within the first 30 days of school, and then you're going to notify parents um, uh, of the difficulty 
it, the kids who have scored um, to show that they are having difficulty with their reading within 15 days. And then um, within, um, within 30 days of that identification, you must have that individual reading improvement plan written and enacted. And um, you're including that supplemental reading intervention program with that IRIP. Okay, sorry, my dates are appearing there. Um, then we, of course, we want that early identification and assessment of skills. Again, some exceptions um, um, are there for this. So any student receiving specialized instruction for limited English proficiency in the le um, for less than two years. So your EL students um, are exempt from um, that screener. Um, any student receiving special ed um, and if they would have something in their IEP that would conflict with giving that screener, they don't need to be assessed. And also any students who have a 504 plan and if, if it would conflict with something in their 504 plan to screen them, then they're exempt as well. So again, we talked about improved assessments. Um, um, most ESU-8 schools are using a cadence. Um, we offer training of, on that. Um, also, AIMS-Web and Map Reading Fluency are approved assessments. So you go ahead and um, you can click on this link um, to the approved assessments, and then um, you can also access their threshold levels there too. But we all need to make sure we're using those approved assessments. Parent engagement is another important component of this legislation. Um, you must notify parents or guardians if their child has been identified as having a reading difficulty. Um, it must be in writing or electronic communication. It's no later than 15 days after that identification. And um, that in, you must tell them that an individual reading improvement plan will be created and shared and parents may be part of this, um, the creation of that plan. Um, that's, that is another component. There are some great resources from NDE um, at those bottom two links. Um, so there's communications resources for the educators and for the parents, um, some sample letters to send out um, and things like that. So um, I would access those and then just um, customize them to fit your district needs. So um, then you get to writing that reading or uh, individual reading improvement plan. We um, call those IRIPs a lot. And so again, they're created for any student who's identified it as having that reading difficulty or falling below the threshold level that's been identified by the vendor and NDE. Uh, it may be created by the classroom teacher, principal, other pertinent school personnel, and parents or guardians. I think that a lot of times our MTSS teams are creating those plans. Um, maybe involving an interventionist, um, people like that. So that's um, really nice to have that team approach. Um, that IRIP shall describe the reading intervention services student will receive through the supplemental reading intervention program. So um, it might talk about um, how many days a week, uh, how many minutes a day, uh, what exact, exact supplemental program they'll be using. Um, and they'll stay on that IRIP or receive an IRIP um, until they're no longer identified as having a reading deficiency. So you might have to go back to that IRIP and make some adjustments. Okay. So um, we, we currently have um, students that have an individualized reading improvement plan um, that they were identified as needing that last December or perhaps January. And we've gone through some of the school year and now we're in this 
current situation that we're in. And so we want to be thinking about um, you have a plan in place for all of your students. And at ND, one of the things that I really appreciated is this um, the way we're thinking about layered support. So we want to get that foundational layer for all students and then start to consider how are we going to individualize this for um, our students that are on an individualized reading improvement plan. So what are some things that you can do to support students while they are not going to the classroom? Um, I think we have 56 participants on our, um, on our Zoom right now. I, I'd like to encourage someone to share something that they have been doing to, um, to support those students with an individualized reading improvement plan. So I'm gonna pause here, give you a chance to think, and then um, I know some brave soul will share um, with our group something that they've been doing. Don't forget to take yourself off mute. Stephanie, would you like to share something that you know a district's doing to support a student with an IRIP? Sure. Um, I've even heard about one of our districts is actually making calls right now um, to um, students and trying to keep up with their interventions. So um, they're, they're using Zoom to keep up with interventions. So the classroom teachers meeting on Zoom with a small group Classroom teacher or interventionist, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they've continued what was happening in the classroom and just shifted it to, um, to through Zoom, instruction through Zoom. Mm -hmm. All right, um, and yes, I'll go ahead. I'm at Chambers Public School and we, I'm also doing one-on-one -on -one Zoom sessions, um, same amount of time, um, 20 to 30 minutes. Um, I just schedule it with the parent and we make it work. Um, same exact same lessons we picked up right from where we left off and hopefully we end right where we plan to so all right gold star for you for sharing and also um taking that step to to meet um one-on-one -on -one with students mm -hmm. anyone else at orchard um i'm using that pdf that you sent out from nde um about is kind of to support the Nebraska reads it had all of the five components and I just kind of divided it out um, across these few weeks that we're sending out packets and I'm sending out a few pages each time and encouraging families to do a couple activities from each of those components and that I'm going to put the link or maybe maybe Stephanie can you put that link in there the um, Nebraska read or the uh, read at home plan is that what you were talking about so, um, and I have part of, um, yes. yeah, the read at home plan has a, um, a wealth of activities that um, teachers could do with students via Zoom or um, technology, or I've also heard of teachers meeting and talking with parents, either phone call, Zoom, FaceTime, and teaching the parent how to do the activity, whether it's phonological awareness, phonemic awareness, phonics, um, vocabulary comprehension and then the parent does those activities and that's another great way to um, really think about how you're supporting your students that have an individualized reading improvement plan yeah and we can go ahead and add that to the end of this presentation to the resources um, since you all have this link so we'll do all that right. after all right thanks for sharing um, how you're currently supporting um, students with an individualized reading improvement plan and also thinking about what are we going to do to uh, moving forward with that? So I'm gonna give you a few examples of things I've heard across the state. Um, and somebody else already mentioned that, the Read at Home Plan for Student Success, um, copying a section of this plan. It is divided, as somebody mentioned, up into five sections, the big five. And um, you could simply copy one section if you find um, based on um, assessments that students are in need of additional support with phonological awareness, you might just print out that section and send it home for parents to do with children. 
And again, I already discussed, you could um, teach the parents how to do this activity. Um, somebody else already mentioned that they're providing one-on-one -on -one instruction. Um, and then the last one is, um, if you perhaps don't have access, parents don't have access and families don't have access to the technology to do um, synchronous learning, perhaps you could think about the packets that you're sending home and how might you personalize the packet for those students with an individualized reading improvement plan. Of course, we wanna not add to that, but how can you modify that um, in order to best meet those students' needs? So those are just a few examples of ways that our um, educators across the state of Nebraska are working towards individualizing instruction for those kiddos that need that um, more targeted support. And I think we had had that question um, on an email string um, with our Title I teachers of, gosh, we're not sending another title packet because we don't want to overwhelm kids. But really, yeah, think about how you can modify what is being sent um, to, to really fit each student's needs. So that's, that's good advice. At Bloomfield, um, we went ahead and sent home packets like the others have done to kind of the individual needs of our reading improvement plan kiddos. And then we turn around and we're gonna give them a break. And then we've created um, some summer reading things that they can do. And then we kind of created another summer reading packet um, that focused on the individuals and what needs they needed. Awesome. In South Sioux City, we did something similar. We've been sending home packets kind of the way you talked about the layered approach we address tier one and then sending packets to everybody we're now creating remote learning videos for kids that are review that they can click on and see and then we also put together packets just for the kids that were in nebraska reads with some of the information from the nebraska reads website and then we included three books for them to read to and our summer, um, our public library summer reading program information. We sent that as well. Great. We're going to um, share some more summer um, ideas in a little bit too. That's awesome. I'm glad you guys are already thinking about that and we are kind of getting towards the end of the year where we have to be thinking about everything. So um, again, that goal is for all students to be reading at or above their grade level by third grade. And um, so uh, we have to think about that supplemental reading intervention program. Um, it should be provided to any student identified as having that reading difficulty. Um, it's implemented during regular school hours in addition to regularly scheduled reading instruction. So unless that's otherwise agreed to by a parent or guardian. So this isn't something that all students identified have to stay after school for um, or to receive their extra instruction, but it should happen during the regular school day. Um, but it can be a commercially published program or additional instruction and practice with evidence-based strategies. But here I think that we just really need to um, emphasize that evidence-based strategies and also any program that you're using you'll want to make sure is researched. Um, we've shared a lot of those um, websites to um, vet programs um, through our MTSS process, things like Evidence for ESSA, What Works Clearinghouse, uh, the Florida Center, all um, would give you lots of um, great programs that are researched. And yep, here we are to our summer reading opportunities. So some of you were already sharing those. Um, it is important that um, that that you provide um, ideas for for summer learning um, for students enrolled in grade one or higher um, that are identified as continuing to have a reading difficulty at the conclusion of the school year. It may be part of an existing summer program, either school or community based, like. Um, South Sioux, I think you mentioned that you are um, sharing the library's um, uh, opportunities for summer. Um, you might have summer school going on, but this year it might look very different. So summer school might be via Zoom or packets. Um, and it may be offered online. So yeah, like Zoom. OK, 
Okay. And maybe Abby has some All right. questions to consider. All right. I just had my worst Zoom nightmare. The uh, Amazon guy came to the door <laughs> and the dog went crazy. So yes. And you've got 50 people out engaged. So that's the reality. Um, and we are well aware of that as, as we watch and hear about teachers working with students and having families here. Um, we're all doing the best we can. All right. Um, so I want to share a few summer reading options that you might think about. Uh, and actually, I'm going to back up a little bit. The legislature does not require that students who have an individualized reading improvement plan attend or participate in a summer reading program. What is required is that schools provide education and options for parents so that they may or may not choose to participate in a summer reading program. I've provided a list here of some suggestions for things that you might um, want to share with, with uh, families in case they are um, willing and able to participate. So you might think about um, those, the learning packets that you've created so far. You might just carry those over into the summer and continue that practice. Um, it's a routine that our students are already, your students might already be involved with. So just continue that, offering those packets and providing feedback as students are working with those. And you might continue to do, um, as one of our participants today talked about, um, the one-on-one -on -one instruction or small group instruction and continue that over the summer. Um, I know that it is highly suggested that we not meet face-to-face -face with students so and have our traditional sort of summer school. So you might think about looking at your school budget to see could we continue our summer school in a different capacity and provide um, that compensation to teachers with your summer school budgets. You might also um, consider um, extent. Can you flip to the next screen? Sure. Okay. All right. You might consider um, providing them families with programs, um, apps, digital resources. There are lots of OER resources. There are, I know that PBS has a wonderful um, video series for families and students. Um, and some of the, the activities on PBS could perhaps be done with minimal parental supervision or support. And all of those activities, there are a number of activities that have been curated on the Nebraska Reads website. If you look under the tab, Summer Reading Options. So all of these are um, ideas. Um, does anybody, would someone be willing to share some ideas that they're doing over the summer? Um, at Chambers, we are, through June, um, we're going to do, each week is going to have a different theme, and then daily there's going to be different challenges, uh, reading challenges, whether that be take a, have your parent take a picture of you reading, to your animal or a stuffed animal or someone younger than them or older than them. Um, and then I'll kind of be the contact person for that. And we'll have a link, uh, a Facebook page and uh, hopefully a, on the web page have that. And then in July, we're hoping to have three mornings a week, um, the summer reading program at school. So hopefully. All right, thanks for sharing. So this is our opportunity to really get creative and think about what what is um, what are the opportunities, what is available to us, how can we be innovative in supporting our um, our young readers. Okay, so we can stop and ponder if your school were to stay closed for the start of the next school year. Um, fall of 2020 or closed again due to another outbreak. What would you change from what you are doing um, to support students with an IRIP? So let's hear from some schools. What, what could we change and do a little differently? Yeah, this is John at Bancroft, Rosalie. Um, 
one thing that I feel like if I'd have known ahead of time I would do different is I, I think we're going to set our kids up in small groups of like five and we're just going to schedule times for those small groups to receive 30 minutes of instruction through Zoom or, or Seesaw or what, whatever the teacher uh, chooses to use, probably Zoom, and then just continue our instruction as we normally would, but limit it to 30 minutes and then send the workbook pages home for the parents to help develop. I, I think if a kid had uh, an hour and a half between math, reading, while well, we're talking about reading here, but in the three core subject areas, I think we could do a pretty good job with that. Great. I know my consideration is that it's always so different with K3 students, you know, it, it instruction is just different online. So any, anyone else with some ideas about what they might do differently if we have some delays next year? Um, this is Kelly Ballinger and Pender. Um, I'm, I'm kind of feeling the same way that, that John is. I, I think that um, as unfortunate as this whole time has been, it's, uh, given us opportunities to play with some uh, some some apps and some other um, you know opportunities uh, that that are out there um, and I we have an autism program in our in our district that has really kind of gone uh, above and beyond and has found some really neat resources to use with kids and and I think that's probably the bright spot in all of this is there are resources out there that we just didn't even know existed we didn't need before and um, and so I think that we could do things a little bit uh, different and, and a little bit better than we are right now. Thank you for sharing. I, I think that that's what it's forced us to do, right? To think differently, to think creatively, to get those resources. It took us a, you know, a week or two to get running with that, but um, um, teachers are amazing and the things that are going on are just amazing right now. And I think it's given us permission to to fail, um, you know, and say, okay, that did not work. What could I do instead? Um, and I think that is has created this enormous learning curve for all of us. Um, and I think that's something to celebrate um, because we're just going to get better, um, better, more innovative, more creative, um, all with um, the focus on doing what's best for kids. Absolutely. Um, speaking of RRIPs, we have a question on the chat. It, um, Abby, is it is it typical to have more kindergarten kids on IRIPs? I'm actually going to open that up to the group. Um, based on your data, based on the assessments that you're using, what are what are folks finding? We're finding we have more in kindergarten on IRIPs in the fall, and then um, about half of them are off by winter. Hmm. Anyone else? Same at Chambers. We had a pretty big group for as small as the classes in the fall, um, and they all actually tested out in the winter. So I would say that that was, is consistent with our school too. So they get to school, get some instruction, and then test out. I will say when writing um, parent letters, um, some of the districts that I worked with last fall were very gentle in how they um, gave that news to um, kindergarten parents, thinking about that's maybe the first letter that they've received home from school. So. And I'm new to this role. Um, and learning, but I just, I think that was part of it as well, Steph, was writing it in a way that kindergarten parents realize your child's only been in school 15 days when we assess them and um, we look forward to their growth at mid-year. Yeah. Um, and, and Steph knows too, we're looking at a new reading program and I'm just wondering if, if that was something that was happening across the, uh, um, area at large because they are kindergartners or if maybe a new reading program will address some of that. Can I ask one more very naive question? There's no, there are no naive questions. Cindy, ask away. <laughs> um, 
I know it's, it says within 30, uh, I think it says within 30 days of school. Or, I'm just wondering, is that 30 school days or 30 days after school starts? Um, that is a very common question. Um, it is within 30 days of students being at school. Okay, within 30 days of students being at school. Okay. So you can think about your testing window for Acadians there and um, where you assess. I, I would be curious as to what people are seeing, which uh, segment of the screener are they struggling with? Because uh, when, when we were having difficulty with students with letter naming fluency, we just started in uh, putting that into our preschool program that the students need to know their letter names before they get done and that really improves your uh, your fall kindergarten scores and we all and, uh, two years ago we also started using the Pelly as an assessment in preschool and I mm -hmm. I think that's helped us to to better prepare our kids when they come in as new kindergartners we, this is Kathy Randolph, and we um, felt like our preschool is doing um, phenomenal and helping us. We only had three kindergartners in the fall on an IREP, and then by winter they were off. Um, we moved stepping stones down to preschool, and our kindergartners um, at, the at the beginning of the year start K PALS. Everybody has that. And then um, we also added EIR. Um, second semester for those kids. We did the placement test and then um, provided that for those kids just for extra um, support to get them ready for first grade. So. Thank you. Thanks for the collaboration. Hearing from your um, fellow schools is, is really awesome and helpful. So a little bit of feedback here. What resources do you feel you need that you can't find? Um, and what supports do you desire? And what kind of resources would you suggest Nebraska Reads makes available? So as um, give, give us feedback to the ESU and to NDE, what, what do you need support with? And you're welcome to either comment aloud or um, add it to the chat. Maybe this is one that you do have to ponder for a minute um, mm -hmm. and nobody's ready to just shout it out and know that um, I'm going to share our emails and of course you can always reach out to us um, with those needs. And, and please don't hesitate to email. Um, we're in that this unique situation and um, there's no research around um, teaching during a pandemic, running a school during a pandemic. Um, Nebraska Department of Education providing support during a pandemic. This is all new territory for us. So what I want to do is be able, and I know Steph too, is to be able to work towards supporting you. Um, but um, it'd be more effective if we knew what, what your needs are in order to, for us to um, support you with meeting your student needs and teacher needs and school needs. Um, there's a question here. Will there be a standardized form for the individualized reading improvement plan provided by NDE? Currently on the website, you'll find a variety of um, suggested templates that you could use. Um, you also, you're welcome to contact me. I've got, there's a, a number of school districts that have done some amazing job, amazing job of um, uh, turning all of that data and all of that information into an uh, electronic database. And so I would be happy to help support you in figuring out how do we, how do we keep track of all this? And um, what, what are the possibilities? What can that look like? But currently there's not one required uh, form. Yeah, and most districts that I've worked with have customized it to just fit their needs. They've 
looked at the um, examples from different districts and, you know, chosen the one that, you know, is closest to what they're looking for and then just tweaked it a little bit. And actually, I just switched the slide here. These are a lot of the resources from NDE. So this would be your link right here, this second link here, right out to those, um, those sample IRIPs. So um, again, these are all links here. They take you all to that um, Nebraska Reads page from NDE. Um, and they're just kind of sectioned out there for you. You could click on those. Um, and here are our emails. Um, if you ever need to contact, please go ahead and reach out to us. Do we have any questions before we say goodbye? I was just curious if you're meeting with parents about this and they don't want, is it, can the parents, um, refuse, not refuse services, but ask, do they have the right to say that, that they don't want this kind of plan for their child? They do. Um, I, uh, we suggest that you handle it in the, using the same protocol that you do with students who deny services for um, special ed services. Um, often, we want to think about what is it that they're afraid of Oh, no. Um, Abby, I, I think I, we lost you on that. Can you? Yeah. Sorry. What point did I get lost? It is, you are able to allow parents to, to deny. Yeah. So follow that same protocol process that you use, um, have in place in your school district in terms of um, special ed services. One of the things that we found is parents that initially um, don't want those services after having that conversation, that gentle conversation and unpacking what is the fear or what is the apprehension, typically come around um, to wanting the services, that extra targeted support. Um, and I often use that term targeted support. We've identified that um, I've learned a lot about your child as a reader and these are the areas of strength of your child and really capitalizing on those strengths. And then here's the areas where um, I um, will be providing your child a targeted instruction. Um, and this is how we provide targeted instruction in, you know, uh, CVC words or some aspect of uh, phonological awareness or vocabulary. So these are some of the things that we're gonna do. They're gonna meet with a, a, um, our reading interventionist and he's going to provide additional support 15 minutes a day, they won't miss um, recess, they won't miss, you know, lunch or socialization, whatever it is. Um, so once you start to have that gentle conversation with them, they often come around. One of our schools that I helped write the letters with, um, uh, they said, you know, in the letter, we're screening you, um, all students at the school to find out, you know, find their reading level, just like we've always done. And, you know, when they described um, the IRIP, they said, and we're going to meet the needs of all students, just like we always do. We, we, we look at every student's results and meet those needs. And so if you show that, hey, this is part of our reading program, we're just working on, you know, that. And I think the schools that have chosen to have like that intervention time where or some schools call it a what I need time. So students are either working on extension or intervention all at the same time. It's easier for parents to maybe swallow that, you know, and understand that everybody's working on the skills where they are. Thank you. Yeah, our concern as we're planning summer school, our concern was just that parents might have been overwhelmed already with the amount of, you know, work that they're responsible to help their student with. And so if they refuse summer school, um, just what that might mean for us in the fall, I guess. Sure. That was, so that was a, a conversation we had, one of our concerns. Yeah, and, and again, um, it is not required that students that have an individualized reading improvement plan participate in some form of, of summer school. We are 
required to provide them families options so that they can, ten, can continue summer learning. But it's not a requirement that students participate in it. We have the question, is there an online piece to EIR? Um, I don't believe so, not that I've ever heard of. Has anybody ever heard of an online piece with EIR? No, and my question about that, Stephanie, okay. is if we get to the point where we need to offer, we are currently not doing EIR right now with our students um, who are receiving those services. And if we need to implement that in the fall in this kind of learning environment, I didn't know if those pieces were available online so you could share your screen with a student and have them follow along. I didn't know. Not that I've ever heard of. Mm -mm. Okay. I mean, and teachers can make their own resources or it's, use it's maybe a document yeah. camera or something if we need to do that. Sure, sure. That's a discussion we've been having with some of our, our staff about how we can do that. One of my concerns, and I don't know that the NDE can fix this, is some of our higher need students don't have the resources at home to help them. So even if you tried to set up the Zoom session with them, that's not happening. Or if we send a packet home, parents are not helping those kids. So those are our own struggles, I guess. Well, we want to see what we can do. Um, I have a question, I guess, really quick why we have all of us on here. This is Tabitha from Bloomfield again. Um, I'm running into where I don't know that I have enough of my students having technological devices or the internet to be able to go all Zoom or Seesaw or Google Classroom in the fall. And so I'm really concerned about those kiddos that I'm not gonna be able to reach or I'm hoping I can bring some in the building and try to divide it that way. I guess we're really trying to be creative. I think that's a common concern, especially amongst elementary kids. Um, schools. Um, can you share? Can we share some of your um, problem-solving solutions that you've come up with? Um, we've got fifty some people on here, and I know that's, and I know Bloomfield's not the only one that's had this challenge. I'll say I know one of our districts knew that they found out that only three families did not have internet at home. And so they took the devices off their buses that um, are the hubs for internet and took them to those homes. But I mean, that's a small district <laughs> with only three, three homes in need. So, and not all of us are in that same situation. Really have anything to say for the internet issue um but whoever asked before like they were talking about document cameras and whatnot um i use zoom and i actually just sign in from my computer and my phone and i know it looks really bulky but i just use some type of bracket to hold my phone and use it to project whatever we're working on so that might be an option for you um it works perfect you can adjust it um, and share screen i mean that's a great resource too um, i'm not sure we have surfaces but i can write if parents send me a worksheet i can do the work right on my computer and it's real time for the kids just like i'm sitting in front of them working on a worksheet so um but yeah if you sign into the meeting from your phone or two different devices you can use one as a projector so great idea kelly I've seen the pictures um, of teachers teaching in the bathtubs at their house and writing on the on the walls of their tubs. So, and I, ha I have heard of some teachers. Um, you know, if students don't have iPads or computers, um, if um, parents have uh, a cell phone, then they do a FaceTime and do instruction via FaceTime. I'm Kendra from Walt Hill and I don't, I think it was Newman Grove mentioned, we're going to have that same issue with no technology and um, not really parent involvement or help too. So um, we'll probably have to do somewhat of the packet type situation. Um, and so anything we can have for guidance or help with that, that's kind of the route that 
pretty much our only route that I see us kind of having to take. Has anybody um, had any kind of training for parents on using the technology? We've talked about that at the USU, what that might look like in, in having a parent training. We have not at Bloomfield, but um, last night after our meeting, we had discussed that if we're gonna roll out the Google Classroom and the Seesaw that a little bit more than what we've used now, I feel like we need to have parent training for, um, uh, for our parents and then even for our new students that haven't used it quite as much. Absolutely. I think our, our uh, secondary students can pick it up and use things a little bit quicker on their own than our little guys. We used Google, this is Kelly and Pender. Um, we used uh, Google Classroom and Seesaw all school year, so that was a little bit easier to deploy for us. But um, where I've seen the most growth, I mentioned it before, was our um, was our autism program and some of the kids whose needs are the most significant. Um, we, we don't have a device issue because we're one-to-one -one K-12, but they were able to do things like set a timer on their devices before they left. So every Monday through Friday when that timer goes off, the kids know to pick up their device and there's a, a Zoom session waiting for them. I mean, there was just really like fun little things that they, that they have done. Um, because we want to be careful not to burden parents too much either because this is a really hard time for them as well. Um, you know, many of them are not used to being teachers or being home with their kids. And so I think there's little like, you know, just tricks and things that you could do to that don't require as much parent involvement as we think it does. Our, our kids are pretty, you know, tech savvy. Sure. So one of the things you um, districts might think about is um, there perhaps might be rolling closures next um, this next school year, and it might become a higher priority to do some um, instruction with K3 students on using the technology so that they are a little more proficient with it before they we send them back um, home for a, a potential rolling closure. So that might become a higher priority. Another thought I wanted to share with you, I wish I knew which district this was to give them kudos credit for this, um, reached out to their community and said, we um, have an access to technology issue. Um, we are in need of 20 iPads or uh, 15 laptops or access hotspots. Would, um, are you available to, to contribute? And the community responded and said, yes, because there are, there are businesses that the community wants to be able to support and they're not sure how to support. So um, put that on your Facebook page, your Twitter page, um, get that out there and, and really reach out to your community. This is a time for them to give back and support us. Great. And I know um, the ESU is looking ahead to, you know, if the beginning of our school year um, doesn't look the same or if next school year we have closings and um, how you can address that. So we are working on some resources for you to get out too. So we, we're partnering with you, but we always want to know exactly um, the supports that you need. So thank you so much to all of you for sharing ideas today and collaborating together. This is David Osman. Um, just having the technology and having access to the internet does not solve a lot of problems. <laughs> Um, we've been uh, one to one K uh, 12 for several years uh, for our parents that didn't have the internet we we're paying the bill for them to have the internet during this um, but we've gradually seen a wane in participation uh, and um, our principal and myself we do home visits uh, to try to encourage kids but the problem still is uh, getting kids to participate and having any type of uh, uh, enforcement, um, whether you're using grades, some school districts are only doing enrichment. Um, you know, we're doing new learning. We're using Zoom and, and uh, Seesaw. We've uh, set up a schedule where our kids participate. But, uh, you know, the, the question becomes, even if you have all those things in place, 
how do you ensure participation from students? Yeah, and it's that continued conversation about student engagement, um, whether they're in in the classroom or not. Um, and I have two children, and I'll confess to all 50 of you, my high school son slept through all of his Zoom classes yesterday. <laughs> um, so the struggle is real um, for all of us. Um, and so we are constantly thinking about, um, and I really appreciate, is it Dave that brought up, um, student engagement is a challenge, whether they're in a classroom, how do we engage all students who have different learning styles um, on top of, um, this is a, a learning environment that we're not used to, and so providing guidance on how we can engage our students. Um, uh, I mean, let's acknowledge that it, it is a challenge and it continues to be a challenge and we'll have to continue to problem solve that. Um, Absolutely. Well, thanks everyone. Um, I guess we will sign off here, but just know that Abby and I are here uh, anytime you have questions. So just shoot them our way. And um, thank you for all that you are doing for kids. So um, it doesn't go unnoticed that teachers are superheroes once again. <laughs>